Hi, and welcome to Artistic Adventures at BB Library. My name is Holly, and today we're going to be looking at somebody who is not an artist, but probably made the very first art supply you ever use, and that is the, the crayon. Uh, so he was an inventor, and uh, his creation was the Crayola crayon. So let me show you a picture of him. His name was Edwin Benny. And he was born in 1866. That's just the year after the um, after the Civil War ended. And um, he had a factory. And you'll find out more about him when we read the book. And in fact, he was very, very proud. Here is what the first box of crayon would have looked like in those days. It was very, very innovative. So even though he's not an artist, he is probably responsible for, I don't know, thousands and thousands of, of young people doing creative expression using different art supplies and using their creativity and maybe even inspiring people to go into art themselves. So let's go to our book. It, it's called Crayola Man um, and it's um, written by, grab my book. It's written by Natasha Bebo and illustrated by Stephen Salerno and is published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Okay, The Crayon Man, the true story of the invention of Crayola crayons. Once there was a man who saw color everywhere. He noticed the yellow-orange petals of the black-eyed Susans in his garden. He marveled at the rich scarlet-red tones of the cardinal's feathers. He admired the deep blue-greens of the waves in the sea. Color made him really, really happy. But all day long, at work, all he saw was black. Black dust, black tar, black smoke, black ink, black dye, black shoe polish. His company sold carbon black, a new kind of pigment or colored substance made from the soot of burning oil and natural gas. People used it in printing inks, electric street lamps, and stove and shoe polish. It also made rubber car tires last much longer. His name was Edwin Binney, and he was an inventor. He worked with his cousin, C. Harold Smith. Together, they were Binney and Smith. Harold was a great salesman. He loved to travel the world. Edwin was curious. He had a knack for listening and making what people needed. Edwin invented a new kind of inexpensive slate pencil that wrote very smoothly. It was gray. Children loved it. He invented a kind of chalk that wasn't dusty and didn't crumble. It was white. Teachers loved it. He invented a wax crayon that would write on wood and paper packaging. It was really, really black. People loved it. Paper was expensive in the 1800s, so children wrote with slate pencils or chalk on slates, a small handheld blackboard. There's one right there. So rather than paper and pencil, the kids would do all of their, their math and their writing on the slates. So when everyone, including Edwin's wife, Alice, told him that children needed better, cheaper crayons, he listened. They said, the crayons we have are big, dull, and clumsy. The lumps of colored clay only make fat, clucky lines. And the artist crayons from Europe are far too expensive they crumble and break easily, and some are even poisonous. Alice used to be a school teacher, so she knew what children needed. She encouraged Edwin to invent the crayons. Edwin thought about his company's inventions. When you do a picture with their, when you drew a picture with their gray slate pencil, it rubbed off at the drop of a hat. When you do a picture with their white chalk, it smudged everywhere. If you drew with Edwin's new, really black crayon, it was, well, really black. None of these inventions was any good for drawing in color. But look what here, hmm, he's thinking about it. So Edwin listened and Edwin invented. In a small stone mill in Pennsylvania, in a top secret lab, Edwin's team experimented. How could they make better, stronger crayons? Melted paraffin wax? Maybe. The first colored crayons invented in Europe were made from a mixture of charcoal and oil, so they broke easily. 
To make stronger crayons, Edwin tried using wax instead. Now for the crayon colors. Grinding, grinding, grinding up rocks and minerals into fine powders. Mixing, mixing. Slate for gray, earth for yellow, red, and brown, perhaps. Oh yes, and lapis for blue. Pounding, sifting, and heating the colored powders, would they be bright enough? Edwin's team kept on trying. They kept on experimenting. Ground up rocks and minerals made bright pigments for crayons, like red, iron oxide, hematite, made red, yellow iron, yellow iron oxide, gothite, for yellow, varied shades of red iron oxide for brown, carbon black for black, zinc oxide for white, and imported ultramarine made from lapis lazuli for blue. They came home covered in colors. They experimented some more and discovered a pinch of this pigment, a sploosh of that, a little hotter, a little cooler, and voila, lots of different shades. Now there were greens, orange, violets, and pinks too. Edwin came home colored in covers, colors. To make orange, green, and violet, chemists blended various pigments in clay. Some minerals changed colors when heated. Plus, the length of time the mi mixtures were left to cool created different colors, too. In a large tub at the mill, Edwin's team measured out the ingredients. Melted wax, clay to thicken, something for texture, colored powders, each in just the right amount every time to make a top secret formula. Slowly, carefully, stirring by hand, they poured the special formula into thin crayon-shaped molds, smaller than any other inventors, just the right size for our children's hands. The mixture cooled and hardened. Edwin watched and Edwin, Edwin waited. Children might eat or chew the crayons and get sick, so Edwin's team experimented to find a new, safe, non-toxic color and materials. Finally, one summer evening in June 1903, Edwin came home covered in color and announced that he'd invented a new kind of colored crayon. But what should he call it? Alice had an idea. She said, let's mix the French word cray for stick of chalk and the word ola from the word oliginous, which means oily like, the oily texture of the crayon to invent a new word. Crayola, crayola. Edwin listened. Benny and Smith shipped out the first Crayola crayon boxes. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, brown, and black. Eight colored crayons for only a nickel. Edwin waited. Would the children like them? Children did. Now they could draw a tiny green caterpillar or the big blue sky. Their drawings wouldn't smudge. They wouldn't rub out. They were bright and could last a long, long time. By the 1900s, inventors had figured out how to make cheaper paper from wood pulp, so children could now draw on paper instead of just slate. Excitement over the new colorful invention spread like wildfire. Admirers from far and wide flocked to marvel at Benny and Smith's inventions at the St. Louis World's Fair. The company's dustless chalk even won a gold medal. Proudly, Edwin and Harold showed it off, especially on their new Crayola crayon boxes. Right there, they've got gold medal. Every day, Edwin brought colorful bouquets from his garden to inspire the Crayola team. They made crayons in even different shades, and later asked children to help name some of them. Yeah, a few years ago, they, they did this too. Well, so to celebrate their 90th anniversary, Crayola held a color naming competition. The six-year-old winner coined Tropical Rainforest, and other color names created by children included Robin's Egg Blue, Tickle Me Pink, and Macaroni and Cheese. At last, because of Edwin Binney, the man who saw colors everywhere, who had a knack of listening and making what people needed, children all around the world could reach for just the right shade. Sun glow, wisteria, jungle green, 
Screaming Green, Razzmatazz, Robin's Egg Blue, Wild Watermelon, Mobilis, Purple Mountain Majesty, Cadet Blue, Lavender, Timberwolf. To draw anything. And this was the page that interested me about this book. Uh, in fact, I'm going to turn. The author included something that I, I'm not used to seeing in the back of, of uh, biographies like this. And she included two things. One were what are called primary sources. And a primary source is when you have like a person that has either experienced it, for example, if they lived through the Civil War and they, wore, they wrote a, a diary about how they were feeling, what was going on, that's a primary source. Or um, if somebody has uh, known somebody personally that, they've, that is being written about. And in this case, two people that she used in the book that's listed in the back as primary sources. One is the, um, the great granddaughter of Edwin Binney. And um, she talked to her and asked questions, you know, like what's come down through the family about, about him and his company. So she was a firsthand person that, that knew, um, knew stuff that, that happened to her, as well as uh, a big one for writing this book was a woman by the name Marie, Marie Falco. She came uh, on in 1912 as um, the head of the crayon department at Benny and Smith Company. And actually, kind of interesting, she's one of the very first females who was an executive in a large corporation. She wrote a book called Mr. Benny, As I Knew Him. So she used that. She was able to go and read about Mr. Benny, what he was like during the time that he was at the, at the factory. So, um, and another person was uh, Helen Benny Kitchell, was, uh, was another person that was... Um, one of his, his great nieces who knew him and uh, had an interview with her, remembering when she was a young girl, as she talked a lot about going into the garden and looking at the colors of the flowers with him and what a great lover of gardens he was. So those were some first, they were primary source people. They knew him, they had stories they could tell about him and fill in information about his life. But um, most books are written with, with what's used a secondary source. So that's not, you're not talking to somebody who actually knew the person or lived through the event. But um, this book actually is a secondary, a secondary source because she did all the research talking to all the people who knew. And when she wrote this, she doesn't know Mr. Benny, never met him, but she got all this great information from, from these people and she wrote this. So a secondary source is somebody who is who has done a lot of research, but doesn't have any firsthand, they weren't there when things happened. And, um, you know, for example, if you wanted to write, um, write down what's been going on with you lately and write it down either in a journal or, or make a memoir, you are then writing a primary source because you're that person, you've lived that life. But if years now you become famous and somebody says, oh my gosh, I found the diary of, of you, and they read it, and they wrote the story of your life, that would be a secondary source because they, you're the first, they're the second. So that's it, but this is one of the few books I've seen that they actually did list the sources she went, as well as she did tour the factory and saw a lot of the, uh, the processes that were done at the time that Benny was actually working. But now, well, let's go on, let's do some things. So I have three different projects that all use crayons. So I'm going to just move my camera and First we'll take see today is something called color transfer. And for this, you're just going to need paper and crayons. So I'm going to take a paper and just um, color any way you'd like on it to, to fill it up or at least fill up the area that you want to do some work. What we're going to do is we're going to, to draw a picture using just using, cray, um, using crayons not a picture. We're gonna. So this is what I did right here. I made my original sheet, and I wanted to do a picture of these um, these little fish. And the transfer part comes is that you put this down over the the side that you've 
you put the crayon all over and then you're just going to trace you're going to draw a picture and then just trace it this one you can see i've traced a few times because sometimes you um are going to want to um go back over when i when i did it the first time some of it was too light or i didn't like the way it turned out so just keep going until you get it and when you're done you've just traced over everything you're going to get a picture with some surprising colors if while you're putting down your colors you're coloring there if you know that you want to have like i could have if i wanted i could have made sure that it was blue down here or the water was blue or the fish were the colors i wanted but it's really it's fun and kind of interesting i used to make cards doing this and if it's not dark enough or if for example like i'd like to have this tail a little bit darker i can take and place it over a darker color like right there and in a little bit more and now my tail is a little bit darker than it was so it's color transfer very simple it just is the fact that the, the the crayon color will transfer onto the sheet okay our next one is pretty cool and we're gonna color with probably a, a color of um, crayon that you don't color with too much and that is white and as you can I'm sure you can figure out why because if I color on here it's not going to not going to show in fact a friend and I used to do this to pass notes to each other we would we would we would sit and um, write our messages whatever we wanted to write on the um, on the paper and um, then we'd give it to each other and when we get home we would do the next so you're just gonna start by making you don't want to cover color everything here you want to just make some patterns someplace on it. I just, for some reason, I seem to like these kind of curly cue sort of things. Then you're going to take your trusty palette of watercolors and um, just get some watercolor on your brush and paint wherever you want. And what do you notice? Wherever you've used the crayon, you'll see that uh, it is, um, it doesn't paint over it. And that's because if you remember from the book that um, crayons were made of wax and wax is, um, is in a sense waterproof. It just, it, it, um, it won't allow the, the paint to permeate through the wax to get to them down to the paper. And I don't know, I always seem to paint the same things. I, I, for some reason, I like these kind of rainbowy looking things. But um, it's fun. This is, it's really fun, especially maybe you could have somebody, a friend or a brother or sister, they could do the white and you could paint and try to discover what their pattern was. So and it depends on like this one, I actually got the colors pretty dark, but the my one I made for a sample, I really like. It's, there's something about it that I, I like, but you can see that I use that same sort of swirly pattern on it. But I thought that was that was pretty cool. So that is um, color resist. So you just need paper, a white crayon, and some paints. If you don't have um, uh, any a palette of paints, you can use food coloring and a little bit of water. It really any any paint, pretty much, or any coloring does um, not cover over the white crayon. Our last technique is just melted crayon art. And for this, you're gonna to need to get uh, a grater of some sort. Um, I'm gonna use this one, although this, that one works well. And so the first thing you're gonna do is you're just going to grate some colored crayons. I'm gonna go with fall colors today because I, I have some leaves that I've, just gonna grate some of this in. Yes, I to upgraded down the ends, but it probably probably be happier if you grate down the um, the ends of your crayons rather than the rather than what I'm doing. So it takes a little little while, but it's fun. Hmm. Let me see. Here's another fall color. This is a project that that I've done using using um an iron 
and it always has been frustrating because the, you're getting the iron the right temperature, not too hot, not too cold. And so I figured out that um, I have a tool that works just about as well and um, I don't have to fuss around with the, with the iron. So let me see, I'll do that. So I thought it would be fun to, to do some, some leaves. In fact, here's a little one that I, I did earlier that got some color on it. Here's one that is um, yet to be done. And here's one I did just using, just using paper. I didn't, I did this quickly, so I didn't take enough time. I would probably have put, put more on here. So you're gonna put your leaf on the paper and fold it over. Just the folding over is just so that the little crayon pieces don't go everywhere. And what you're going to use to heat it is something you probably have around your house, a trusty old um, hair dryer. So I'm just gonna turn it on. And I do, I think that you know, do this with somebody else in your family, because this, even though it's not an iron, it still does get hot. And here we go. see that it's starting to get hot you'll see a change it's almost like it's um almost looks like it's getting a little bit damp uh, don't put your hair dryer right down on it hold it up a couple inches and we're gonna get the other side Okay, that looks pretty good. So I'm just gonna press it down to help it stick a little bit more to the, to the leaf. And uh, don't use paper for this. Use wax paper or this is parchment paper I'm using. And I'm sorry, I had no white parchment paper today, um, but white works really well because you can um, actually take it. There we go. So I've got some color on my leaves, even though it's brown, it's fall colored. Um, and what you can do if you've got the lighter paper is if you just fold it over, you cut and tape it, you can put that up, put that up on your window and it, it looks really pretty like a sun catcher. Okay, well thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining me. Uh, next week, our artist is um, Vasily Kandinsky, who I'm, I'm really excited, he's one of my favorites. He's Russian and he's a painter who is um, considered to be one of the first avant-garde painters, which means you look at the pictures, you say, what in the world is that? But th to explain his thing is that he has a condition called synesthesia, which um, caused him to, when he was painting, to hear sounds. And so he didn't really paint what he was seeing, he painted what he was hearing, what the colors told him to do. And that is a real thing. I had a friend in college who, um, had synesthesia, but she was the other way around. She was a musician. And when she played the piano, whatever key she was playing in had a different sound. And if you wanted to drive her crazy, you would take a song that should have been played like down here on the piano and played it just a little bit higher. And if she knew the song, it was like, no, no, that song isn't green, it's supposed to be orange. And so it, it's, it's a, a really interesting thing. So he saw colors as sounds and uh, was very tied into music um, in the early part of the, the 20th century. And uh, I find him just fascinating. His art is so beautiful, but a little weird. So we're gonna see if we can't create something. You know, what do we hear when we see the colors? So thank you, I hope, hope to see you next time and um, goodbye. <laughs>